Hi everyone, welcome to the All Inclusive Podcast, where each week I chat with industry experts and diversity, equity, inclusion executives from the world's leading global brands who share their knowledge, experience and actionable takeaways to help inclusive employers create cultures of belonging where everyone can thrive. Today I have the pleasure of being joined by Jason Otley. He is the Chief Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Officer at Arlington Public Schools. Hi Jason. Hey, hi Natasha, how are you? I'm great, how are you today? I'm well, excited about this podcast. Oh yes, I'm so glad that you've been able to join us. Um, so I think, why not kick things off by telling our listeners a little bit about yourself and your journey to where you are today? Okay, great. Uh, hello everybody, I'm Jay Snotley, as Natasha mentioned, a Chief Diversity Equity Inclusion Officer in Arlington Public Schools. Uh, been in the diversity, equity, inclusion space for quite some time now. Um, and if I can elaborate just a little more on that, probably since I've been alive as an African-American boy growing up, growing up in Washington, D.C., uh, during the height of the crack epidemic, um, violence was at an all-time high. I believe Washington, D.C. was uh, coined the murder capital of the world uh, during that time. Um, diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion certainly did not exist in the early part uh, of the 80s, and there were a lot of structures and uh, policies in place that kept those who have uh, from those uh, who did not have. And so there was a, a lot of inequities and huge opportunity gaps uh, between races. And uh, I experienced that as a young African-American boy. And so my excitement to uh, get out of the city was not to to uh, leave the city and forget about my community, but to leave the city and gain education to come back and provide uh, more opportunities to provide a voice and to advocate for uh, my community where they may have been voiceless. And so that's exactly what I did when I away to school and earned uh, a few degrees and came back and have been in education for the last 18 years. And this has been uh, the joy of, of my journey in being able to uh, work with leaders, um, in school districts, superintendents, school boards, uh, as well as students as it relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion. How do we close those opportunity gaps? How do we provide equitable opportunities for the most historically marginalized communities? And then how do we not repeat this again? Um, how do we not create this band-aid approach where it's good for right now, but then in a few years, we're going to uh, have these things um, become perilous to our communities uh, yet again. So that, have, that has been the, the nature of my work uh, for the last 18 years is providing uh, opportunities for uh, historically marginalized communities to be at the table, have a voice at the table and feel as if they belong at the table. Years ago, Natasha, we talked about providing access for, for folks uh, who didn't have access. And then we talked about providing voice. But now we have to move the needle even more because I can have access and a voice, but not feel as if I belong at the table. How do we provide that sense of belonging? And so that's a lot of the work that, I, that I'm engrossed in now. So what difference do you see DE and I making to the educational sector? Mm. You know, education space is uh, a great place for all uh, school districts to be heavily involved in DEI because we are producing the next, you name it, you name the industry, you name the profession, they have to come through our school systems. And so it is incumbent upon the, um, the world of education to be pioneers and champions uh, for diversity, equity, and inclusion as we prepare students for the world. Now we can prepare them uh, in ways where they do well at the next level uh, academically, but are we also being um, preparing them socially? Are we preparing them mentally? Um, are we focusing on uh, some of the things that we know that they will face at the next level? And a lot of those things largely are, are, are not predicated upon someone's intelligence or brilliance, but how someone navigates uh, the world and, and navigating the world, understanding that um, when you walk out of your home, um, how do people see you? Who are you when you walk out of your home? There are some uh, characteristics, Natasha, that we cannot hide. And so when we walk out of our home, um, unconscious bias 
immediately begins to show up. However, a person has become accustomed to a group of people uh, or not, typically is how people are interacted with. And so in education is the the one area where we need to really strengthen our cords and our ties on preparing our students for this global economy. Um, years ago, many students were leaving uh, high school, going to college, and then into their professions and working for majority white companies or working for majority white leaders. Those aren't, those aren't the times that we're in now. Many students are, are leaving and working in um, predominantly um, companies that where they are people of color at the very top. And so if you've not been introduced or you've not worked in groups or you don't have a, a cultural background uh, to understand the differences and the nuances of all the different cultures and races that uh, make up the wonderful tapestry of our world, then we're really putting our, um, our students particularly um, at risk of not being able to navigate and navigate well. So there's a lot to tackle there. <laughs> so when it... But what you've described, they're all great things and they're all things that, and, and you've kind of touched on the reasons why it's important and what needs to happen. So how do you know what to prioritize? Where do you start? Like, where is most of your time actually being spent and resources being spent in actioning everything that you've said? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, there's so much to do that um, when, you, when you have too much, sometimes we don't do anything. Um, that it stifles our, our progress and our growth because we just don't know where to start. Uh, where I begin to start these last couple of years uh, is really around uh, helping leaders understand what their biases are. When we first understand what our biases are, those, in, those conscious and unconscious biases, then Natasha, what we do is we make better decisions because sometimes we make decisions uh, unconsciously, but our unconscious decisions are predicated upon our unconscious biases. And so if you can understand what your unconscious biases are and check the ones that don't do you nor your organization uh, well, then you're going to then make different decisions, even if they're unconscious decisions, right? And so I think that's really where the, play, the place that we as leaders need to really start is uh, addressing our unconscious biases and how that leads to decision making, how that leads to policies being put in place, how that leads to practices that are outdated, right? How it leads to uh, an environment where everyone doesn't feel welcome. And so when we think about wanting change, wanting to bring bring about change, wanting to be an ally, wanting to be a champion. When we think about those things, uh, we have to first internalize who, what am I bringing to the table? What are my biases? And how can my biases impede groups of folks who I'm trying to help? How can it impede them from actually getting to the next level, right? Um, and so that's where, that's where we start. A lot of that takes place in professional learning and um, professional learning needs to be ongoing. Many industries do a check the box kind of system. Hey, we had professional learning around diversity, around equity, around inclusion once a year and all these people attended and, and people received certificates of completion. But when we go back to measure how impactful um, those professional learning sessions are, we're finding out that they are not as impactful as we think they are because we haven't created a tool to really measure its impact. The only tool we've created is um, who attended. And, and what did you think of the speaker? Great speaker, bring them back next year. <laughs> we can do this all over. But how do we see how the professional learning really does transition and impact your work? That's where we need to begin to measure the impact that um, these trainings have on our staff to really see the growth within our organization. I read a statistic not too long ago. I think it came, the Harvard Business Review uh, was talking uh, about those organizations who are very diverse um, in rep representation um, have the have a higher number of total revenue, have a higher number number of engagement, have low turnover of staff. Like it's an incredible research that is out there that shows to diversify your organization, but then also provide sense of belonging in an organization decreases turnover, which increases revenue. Mm. 
Yeah, I think, I mean, there's a number of reports that are out there. Um, I think the business case is, is definitely there if DEI is implemented and if if you are able to create that diverse, equitable and inclusive workforce, um, your business will be, will be better. Mm-hmm. It will, in general, from a world perspective, you're just doing the right thing. Mm-hmm. But also, you're actually going to be making good on on your organization like you're going to be smashing your goals um people want to work for you those that do work for you will want to work harder for you kind of it it just all makes sense you've spoken about unconscious bias and and what does that look like in practice in terms of measuring because at the moment there isn't i mean people kind of do this on bias unconscious bias training and and they tick a box and as you said it's like that was an amazing speaker yeah really great great session um they should definitely come back next year um but how do how can we measure how effective that training actually was what what do you think is is the best way to do that yeah so there's these implicit bias tests uh, that that are out there that many organizations are having their staff take I think that's a great place to start. Um, then it begins to serve as a tool to open up conversations as to where your biases may exist. Uh, Cause I think many of us don't even know that we have biases. Um, people will say, oh, I'm not racist or I don't, you know, I don't see color. They, they have all of these things, um, but they don't really recognize that they themselves can have biases. And I think that once we begin talking about what each of our biases are, uh, the next part of that is, well, how, how does that impact um, the way that I interact with you. Uh, because if I have a bias against a particular group, the way that I interact with, with that particular group is going to be affected. And then how does the way that I interact with this particular group, how does that make this group feel as if they belong or do not belong in this organization? Because if my interaction with a particular group makes you feel you don't belong, then you're leaving to go someplace else but if you do stay in our organization, we, um, we, we, we think about, well, you're at work and you're present, but you're not productive. Because you're at work, you're present, but you're looking for other work. You're looking for other jobs, other opportunities, right? You're complaining about um, the way that the organization has made you feel. So now that you have decreased the number of hours you're actually putting into the job we thought you you really enjoy. And so I think that um, having table setting the conversation by recognizing where our biases are, then having intentional conver- ongoing conversations on how do my biases impact the work, impact the people that, that I've connected to, um, and then largely how does it um, create a culture in the organization that we're not uh, comfortable having. When we say that we want everyone to feel as if they feel comfortable being part of an organization, we have to look at our culture. Well, what does our culture say? And sometimes those those, uh, surveys, uh, Natasha, is what we really need to do. Mm -hmm. Have we surveyed our teams? Um, Have we done skip level um, meetings where the uh, director may not go to the person that's the direct report but he'll go to their direct report, right? And skip level meetings, surveys, uh, employee resource groups. We need to be able to pull information quantitatively and qualitatively to know what the culture of our organization is. Because Mm -hmm. here's the thing, if we get it right internally, that means we can get it right externally. Who are our clients, right? Who are the people that we're serving? Right. we, We can't serve a uh, diverse clientele and do well by them and not do well by a diverse employee group. It, it, it doesn't work that way, right? Um, people who are clients will realize, oh, this is just smoke and mirrors. Uh, you're not really about this diversity thing if you don't have it done well on the inside. But if we do it well on the inside, that energy and excitement Um, it's the best advertising we could ever have. We don't have to advertise for things within our organization because people who work in the, in the job will be speaking for us outside of the job. Like, look, y'all got to come work here or y'all need to buy your products from us because, you know, we, we appreciate uh, everyone's diversity. So what support do you have from your leadership team to, to actually reach these DEI goals you have created 
Yes, that's a that's a very interesting and complex question. Diversity, equity, inclusion, we all talk about it's needed, but what is needed is not always best supported. Mm. Right? And so we can look at it from a monetary sense where, well, we'll give you X amount of dollars in your budget to do your DEI related initiatives and programs and things of that nature, but nobody really knows how much is needed because they've not, those leaders who oversee the work haven't been engrossed in the work, right? It, it, it's almost like, um, if I can give you a better example, it's almost like a, um, a supervisor who does well in their job, who then becomes a director and does well in their job and then becomes an executive director Right? Do you, do you see the steps? Because they've proven in the job that they can do it well. Well, when you start talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, we don't have a history of leaders, right, who have been in the work so long, who have climbed this ladder from supervisor to director to executive director to chief to really create that pathway of what it looks like, number one, and two, what supports you need. So essentially we're providing what we think support someone needs based upon our own leadership experience in another space or because we've had a few degrees behind our names, right? That should make us smart enough to be able to know the supports that a position like this needs. So I, I say it's complex because most people haven't been in this space as a leader and climbed through to know what is needed and so we begin to provide supports, but they're not always the best supports, the right supports, or enough support. So this position across all industries, when you look at the research, those who are in it will say they feel the least supported. How do you tackle that? How, how, how can you turn it around? If you're, if you're a leader and, and you sit in your position and it's you're not feeling you're getting the right support. What, what do you do? Well, the first part of your question, which is how do you tackle it? Meaning how do you fix it? I got an answer for that. But I think you gave me a part two, which is, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which is what do you do now? What do you do when it's happening now? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we'll go part one. How okay. do you tackle it? <laughs> yeah, so this role... Um, those who are the chief diversity, equity, inclusion officers need to work um, very closely, um, a dotted line to the CEO, the president, whoever makes the top decision. Because diversity, equity, inclusion needs to be interwoven into the entire fabric of the organization. So when we first have created these roles, and these offices, these offices were standalone. They were uh, an office of diversity, equity, and inclusion that had no really direct reports, didn't have not much of a budget, and then their uh, influence was advisory, right? The, right. Influence, the influence can't be advisory. The influence has to be, this is what we're doing. And so in order for it to really, really work and work well and uh, really change the culture of the organization, this role and the role of whoever is at the top need to be uh, hand in hand. Um, this role should still report to whoever is at the top because the person at the top is leading the organization. Um, but this role shouldn't be a reporting uh, upwards to anyone else but the top. Uh, how else you fix that is to provide personnel support. So many times we are hire these chief diversity, equity, inclusion officers and pay them well, Natasha, give them a nice salary, give them an executive assistant, and that's it. Person of one okay. mm. is supposed to change all of the diversity, equity, inclusion, inequities that we know exist in the organization, a person of one, that's impossible. Hmm. So the reason why the position doesn't last so long for those who enter into it, maybe two to three years, uh, is because people get burnt out. They recognize that they cannot provide solutions for the entire organization. 
that the organization uh, has to understand that this person uh, is set is there to help set a course of action, a strategy, a roadmap, be a guide, be an advisor, if you will, um, but they cannot be the one to do it all. You got to have a team to do that. So this person should be able to raise up leaders, to hire folks and raise those leaders up to make sure that diversity, equity, inclusion shows up to every department um, within, um, within an organization. So I think that that's how you fix you, you fix it for, for right now. Connect it with the top, have the top speak the same language coming down. Um, and then you also have a staff and you also have a budget to be able to do these things. Because when you start talking about doing equity audits in an organization, trying to figure out where the blind spots are, or you want to do professional learning and not just professional learning for your top leaders, but professional learning for the entire organization. When you want to do employee resource groups, right? Uh, when you want to do surveys and develop instruments and bring in vendors uh, to assist with some of the work that has to go on, this has to be a, a budget line item that doesn't have to beg for money. Mm, right. Yeah. That makes total sense. And so how, and this goes on to my second part, mm. when you're placed in that position where somewhat your hands are tied behind your back, right? You're leading with your heart. You can see these are all the things that need to happen. And this is what we need to do to make it happen. But the support, the resource is, is tightening up beside you. How, how do you free yourself out of it? How can you, how can you turn it around? Yeah. Yeah. Then that's also a complex question, which goes back to an earlier point I made when I said, Natasha, they, they pay these, these positions really well. And so when you say, how do you change it when you recognize that you don't have the supports that you need, the question you also ask yourself is, by making a stand and saying, hey, either I have these things to perform my job at an optimal level or I'm leaving, that you decide not to say that because you start thinking about how well you're being paid. How well you're being paid does not always involve you, but it, may, it, it, it certainly involves everyone that you're responsible to. So now it's not just about me. It's also about my family who I'm responsible to. And if they're expecting a certain lifestyle, right, then I don't need to do anything to interrupt the lifestyle that my family is expecting. So because of that, I'm just going to keep going along to get along. The renegades uh, who are in this work say, it don't matter what you're paying me. The way that I see it is, unless we make these changes, the, the work you hired me to do, I'm not going to be able to do. Mm, right. So, so either we make these changes or I'm going to just find someplace else for me to be and do this work. Mm -hmm. So certainly in the times that we're in, you know, uh, what we're experiencing in our country, I think a lot of us are trying to just play it cool, play it safe because we don't want to just disrupt too much because of, you know, the recession we're probably about to hit again soon. It's just a lot going on, yeah, right? Yeah. I think that people are looking, it's like a ju juxtaposition. Like, I know what I want to do, <laughs> but then I have this responsibility to, uh, to a family, right? right. And so I, I think though now we are seeing um, a group of Generation Zs uh, who are entering the workforce and certainly our generation Y who, who grew up in a, in a space where if they didn't like it, they were out, right? And so be, with this great resignation, the reason you're seeing a lot of people getting out of positions they were once in because they're like, I, I, don't, have to, I don't have to deal with this. I want to work remote 100%? Cool, then I'm going to go work remote 100%. You don't want to, you want to have me hired here at 100% remote? Then I'll find somebody who will. Oh, I don't like this toxic work environment. Mm, mm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave and go someplace else. We won't even have to have a discussion about it. I'm just, I'm just leaving. Right. Uh, you, you, I don't have a sense of belonging here. Mm, I can do better 
off someplace else. So we're seeing a lot of people who are making those really uh, strong decisions, um, but they're more coming from our Gen Zs um, and, our, uh, and our Gen Ys. I think our Gen Xs, our millennials, and then the baby boomers and all those, I think those folks are remaining in those positions um, a little bit longer than maybe they'd want to, but uh, we are certainly seeing a revolution uh, from the, the last two generations. Mm. Oh, Jason, I feel like I could speak to you for so much longer. Um, I, this conversation is is so good. Um, just before you leave us, what are what would you say is one of the things that DEI leaders aren't talking enough about, and they should be talking more about? Mm, not talking enough about. Hey, there was a question you asked me about how do you prioritize? You know all the things. <laughs> Right. I think that um, maybe that's what it is. Maybe we're not talking enough about how do we prioritize what is immediate versus what is important, because all of it is important and we're trying to do all of it at the same time. But I don't think enough of us are looking at what are the two or three things uh, that I want my team to focus on that are immediate needs. And can we address these immediate needs right now and gain some traction so that we don't feel like an octopus and we're working on eight, nine, 10 different projects all at the same time. And we're, we're good at many of them, but we're not great in any of them. And I think for DEI leaders, well, let's shift. We know that it's all important, but the pressure of its importancy shouldn't be on you. It should be on the whole organization. Everybody in every department should feel the need to pick up their DEI shovel and get to digging. Everybody. Um, what the DEI offices and the specialists and the coordinators and the directors and chiefs, they should really be the roadmap for the organization. So focus on where are we going and how are we measuring where we're going? How do we know we've made progress? Right. So I think that that's what I'd like to leave with um, those who are in the work and they're feeling like they're drowning and there's not enough support, not enough help. Just focus on two or three areas. Help be the, the, the light post to your organization. Have those tough conversations with your C-suite, uh, your C-suite um, peers and colleagues um, and, you know, encourage uh, everybody to roll up their sleeves. You should not be the only one rolling up your sleeves. Oh. That's great. Fantastic, Jason. Thank you so much for, for today and for that great piece of advice and for all of the, the pieces of, of advice and information that you've been given today in our conversation. Um, it's been really insightful. And I know for our listeners as well, they, they, there's a lot for them to take away from, from today's conversation. Um, how can we, uh, our listeners, best connect with you? You know, I, I gave social media, um, well, at least I gave Instagram uh, a little hiatus for a while, but I will say I, I'm very active on LinkedIn. Uh, those of you who are listening and you are thinking, well, how do I get a hold of this brother and at least follow the work that he's doing? Or, hey, I want to ask him a question. You can find me on LinkedIn, Jason Otley, Otley, O-T-T-L-E-Y. Um, yeah, and, and I, I, I do very much engage in conversations on LinkedIn. Oh, fantastic. Well, I'll definitely um, put the link to your LinkedIn page below for the episodes for anyone who's listening to be able to, to follow the work, the great work that you've been doing and also reach out to you for any questions or any advice. Um, but thanks again, Jason, and um, good luck in the future. Thank you so much.